Shalom, Shabbat Shalom. We welcome everyone to the Tarel Misani congregation. Deuteronomy. You can open the scriptures. Deuteronomy will start perhaps with 22. You know, last time we covered this book, we have looked at the different laws of the Lord, the, law, the laws that he gave to the Israelites, laws where every individual man or woman is brought to the point where he or she is seen as a very valuable, a very precious individual. In the eyes of the Lord, every human being, whoever he or she is, is here brought to that unique pedestal and seen as God's own property, God's creation. You know, reading and studying these laws and seeing God's hand behind every commandment what cannot be, be touched by our God's love for humankind. It says that God so loved the world, you know, he really did. If you read the laws, you're going to feel it, you're going to understand about it. And one cannot fail to see the Messiah through all the law and also standing at the end of the law, standing at the end of Deuteronomy. Why? Because the Mosaic law contains, while it contains much love and grace, these laws are impossible to fulfill. One may follow a few of them, but as a whole, no man can. And these laws come with us with a system of punishment, inevitable penalties. So the person finds himself condemned right at the first law, right at the start. But this is where the Messiah, Yeshua, appears right at the end and takes all the punishments and leaves us with the pure blessings of the commandments. Today we look at some more of these laws. These concern the regulation touching the environment we live in and the animals we share the planet with. For this, we will need to go back to the beginning of uh, Deuteronomy 20 and gather all the few laws that speak about it up to Deuteronomy 27. Now through these, God wanted the Jews to have an awareness of the environment. The intent of these laws was to show that man was not to exploit nature, but to live in harmony with nature. You know, God lent us this planet. We have to make sure that we use it properly. And we will conclude also by covering what I consider the most difficult chapter in Deuteronomy, chapter 28, which covers the curses. Curses for anyone who does not follow the laws, but again, our Messiah is standing right at the end of it waiting for anyone to come to him and to recognize that he died for all these punishments so you can enjoy and live by these laws, the laws of God. There is one law I want to bring you first. This one is in chapter 22, not 20. Let's go 22. 22 verse 10. Look what it says, very simple. You, know, you shall not plow with an ox and a donkey together. What happens when you plow with an ox and a donkey? One is stronger than the other, and the stronger will work harder and will get tired very fast, while the other is being dragged along, giving little help. The first intent of this commandment is to bring men to realize that animals are individuals who have feelings and experience pain, and they need our care. Initially, the animals were given to men as a help. In the first chapter of Genesis, Adam was called to have dominion over the animals of the world, all of them. That is before sin entered the world. After the fall and stand of a harmonious relation between man and the animal world, men and animals fear each other. And men succeeded to have dominion only on a few of them. And it is to those animals that now the Mosaic law turns to. It protects them from abuse, from mistreatment, and reminds us that they are God's creation, they are God's possession. And the scripture, scriptures goes far as telling us that the mark of a righteous man, the mark of a redeemed man, is that he will take good care of his animals. We can go for this in Proverbs 12 too, you can see it on the screen. There it says, a righteous man regards the life of his animals. You know, there's a word here that is very important in the Hebrew. It's the word regards. It means to know well, to know intimately, right? Animals, I want to tell you, the law tells you they're not machines. They have emotions, feelings. They have different personalities. And here, the righteous one is the one who learns about his animals and tenderly takes care of them. Another verse, Proverbs 27, 23. 
which carries the same Hebrew word, by the way, but we have a different word in the English. It says, be diligent, that is the same word. Be diligent to know the state of your flocks and attend to your herds. The word diligent is the same as the word regards in Proverbs 10, 12. We are called to know each individual within a flock, if you have a flock, and take good care of them. Isn't this not a great law? Can't you see like, the, the, the God of the Bible, how great he is as he takes care of his creation, even the animals? He knows them each and every one. And we also learned that the Shabbat, the great Shabbat, was not only for men, but for the animals as well. In Exodus 20.10, it says, But se the seventh day is the Shabbat of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your cattle, nor your animal. Right? Another related law is found in our text of Deuteronomy 25.4. You can go there. This is a great passage. Deuteronomy 25.4. You shall not muzzle an ox while he treads out the grain. While animals work and provides for us, we are not to deprive them of their food. At no time should they be deprived of food if they are in our care. We are held responsible. And the importance given to this law is seen in that this, this passage is used in the New Testament to speak of human workers, especially of those who are in the ministry. 1 Timothy 5, 17, 18 says, Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrines. For the scripture says it, You shall not muzzle an ox while it trades out the grain and the laborer, is worthy of his wages. The lesson for us is clear. The person and even the animals who work deserve good treatment and need to be paid. If a person is harvesting, it deserves to share in the harvest. And what I find extraordinary here is that the animals are almost brought to the same level as a human worker. The message is clear, I believe. They are important in the eyes of God. And we can also say that our attitude towards animals will reflect our attitudes towards men and vice versa. See how a man treats his animal, he will probably treat you the same way. In fact, the word steward or stewardship, a word that is found in our Bibles to describe one who takes care of a household or a sp in a spiritual sense, one that manages well his spiritual gifts, is in its origin related to the animal world. The word steward came from the old English word, sty and word. A sty word was a person who looked after the animals on a rich man's estate. In time, it came to mean the person who managed the entire estate. Still later, it became a family name. And while the steward did not own the estate he managed, he managed it as a trusted servant of its owner. This is the basic principle of a stewardship. It begins by recognizing God's overall ownership, such as his creation. We today are entrusted with God's estate for a time, like the animal world, and so we must recognize our responsibility to take care for it. And there's a beautiful law concerning the mother bird. Turn to Deut Deuteronomy 22, verses 6 to 7. I want to tell you, you know, many times the law will surprise us with things we do not expect to find there. See what it says and try to figure out why the Lord gave us this law. Let me read it for you. It says, If a bird's nest happens to be before you along the way, in any tree or on the ground, with young ones or eggs, with a mother sitting on the young or on the eggs, you shall not take the mother with the young. You shall surely let the mother go and take the young for yourself, that it may be well with you and that you may prolong your days. Now, what is the intent of this law? You know, it's been argued that the Mosaic law is not all-inclusive. That is, you will not find all the laws one need to govern a country or to govern one's behavior. But I think it does contain all that we need to formulate countless of laws. What the Bible gives us are the basics from which stems all the laws. And this is what we find here. In fact, you know that our system of law is based on the Mosaic law itself. So how are we to, uh, going to understand this law? Why take the eggs 
or the young ones and not the mother. Some have said that the mother is needed because she is the source of food supply. Others said that she is needed for the keeping of balance in the environment, otherwise there will be an increase of insects and other such animals. However, while these things may be true, there is something I believe much deeper here. There is a recurring theme in the law about the sanctity, the loving relationship between mother and child. For instance, we are told in Leviticus 22:28, whether it is a cow or you do not kill both her and her young at the same day. Why? The mother was not to be killed on the same day as the kid. Why did he give us this law? Another passage gives us more light. We have seen it in Deuteronomy 14:21, where we read, And you shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. Why this law? First, I want to tell you the idolatrous nations around Israel did that very thing. This was a Canaanite fertility rite. They will kill both the mother and the kid and will boil the kid and or the young goat in its mother's milk. The Israelites were forbidden to kill and eat both the mother and the kid at the same time because the first underlying thread in doing this is a disregard of the precious relationship between mother and child between parents and children, and ultimately, between God and His Son. At the end of this law, the Israelite will come out with a deeper respect, not only for the animal world, but for his parents, for the authority put in place by God, and I believe will be much better prepared to understand and grasp the implication of this great truth of the Father giving His Son for us. Not as Abraham gave Isaac, which they already knew, but of God giving his only begotten son, so we may have salvation. I believe it is the greatest act of God, sending his son, and it permeates in his book. And this was to prepare the Israelites to receive the blessings. In fact, the whole law speaks about the Messiah. But the law does not stop with the animals. It also covers the environment we live in. There is such a beautiful law concerning the trees, even the trees. Let's go to Deuteronomy 20 and read verse 19 to 20. Deuteronomy 20, verses 19 to 20, and see what it says. It says, when you besiege a city for a long time, while making war against it to take it, you shall not destroy its trees by wielding an axe against them. If you can eat of them, do not cut them down to use in the siege. For the tree of the field is man's food. Verse 20. Only the trees which you know are not trees for food, you may destroy and cut down to build siege works against the city that makes war with you until it is subdued. You know, this is the case when an army of Israel is brought to a faraway city after that, the city is first offer a peace treaty and refuse it, as the former verses tell us. The Israelites will besiege it. And here we see that even at war, they were, under, they were to abide under specific laws. And we learned that at the time, by the way, military powers punished their enemies by aimlessly laying waste the land. But here God commands the Israelites not to do this to take good care of the land, because it is his. In this case, they could use the trees for food, but only as much as they needed to. But they were not to destroy any fruit trees. Do you see how caring the law is for an environment? You need wood, only use what you need. Do not touch the fruit trees. You can only eat of the fruit trees, but do not destroy them. You don't have to destroy them. Why? Because they belong to God. The law, I want to tell you, gives wisdom. Not only does it ask man to respect the environment and not to abuse it, but it brings him to think of his neighbor. The siege of the city was not to last forever, and other people were to live there. Whoever these people would, would be, they would use the same land. These trees were there for them as well. 
At the end of this law, I want to tell you the individual will be left with the respect of his environment, realizing that it belongs to God, and also will be left with a great respect for his neighbor. Remember what Jesus says, Matthew 22. Remember in the gospel when one person asked the Messiah, Teacher, which is the great commandment of the law? Jesus said two things that we find in this law. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And what is the second one? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Both of these things, the love of God, the love of your neighbors, are found in the laws of the trees. But the Bible goes much further in that it actually relates the sad state of the environment and the animal world. As one animal today eats another and fear reigns among the animal world instead of harmony, this state, I want to tell you, the Bible attributes to our sins. Has anyone made a correlation of the sad state of our environment, of our planet with our sin? Actually, Paul did. In Romans 8, 19 to 20, see what he says. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption, he says, into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans, and it's waiting for the salvation of God. And it labors with birth pangs together until now. As men suffer in this world, so are the animals. So is the whole creation suffering, the Bible says. Sin, I want to tell you, is much bigger than we think. And the fall, as the fall of Adam, every creature had been subjected to a state of servitude, state of pain and death. And I believe that it is man's task today to try as much as he can to bring order to his environment. And this harmonious order is one that is promised at the time to come. Remember that passage of Isaiah 11? Just see what it says in verse 6. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. It will not eat the lamb. It will dwell together. And it says, The leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf with the young lion, and the uh, fatling together. And the little child shall lead them. Do you feel the harmony of it all? No more would animals eat each other. They will eat together. And what will that bring that about? Verse 10. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse who shall stand as a banner to the people. Who's the root of Jesse? Jesus, the Messiah. Jesse was David's father. It is then when Jesus will come and rule the earth that when animals and the environment will finally find its rest. In the meantime, man should act responsibly towards his environment. He must practice the laws of conservation the conservation of the earth as much as we can. I think this is the role of every believer. This is the law of God. And these are the laws of God. We have seen from chapter 12 till the end of chapter 25, many laws from which many endless applications could be drawn. Application covering all aspects of our lives. And it is after the exposition of these laws that Moses begins a new section. A third address. The first address was the introduction, chapter 1 to 4, then the law, 5 to 26. Now, from 27 to 28, this is the most difficult part of the book. It is also the most difficult part, I believe, of the whole Bible, because it speaks of curses, curses that will befall the Israelites if they do not abide in the law, something that did happen in history and is happening now. Sixteen times the word curse is mentioned between... Deuteronomy 27 to 28. It is really a hard passage. And so many of them... By the way, what, what is behind these curses? You know, we're going to, to read some of them. You know, let, let us remember that the cross stands at the end of Deuteronomy 28. Yeshua stands there as John saw him in Revelation 5. As the lamb, it says, as though it had been slain. You know, they told them, look at the, the lion of Judah. He thought he was going to see the lion of Judah, but he saw a lamb that was slain. 
because he took all those curses we're going to read upon him if, of course, we recognize him as our personal savior. And at the end of these curses stands 2 Corinthians 5.21, which says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, for we might become, but we might become the righteousness of God in him. Let us now see what the life without God would end up to be. Let us begin with the curses in Deuteronomy 28. And there is something that we see in this chapter, one thing, coupled with Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28, it is the same thing. Uh, first, I want to show you a chart. You know, Deuteronomy 28 really speaks of what we call the times of the Gentiles. Deuteronomy 28 was a prophecy of Moses even before the Israelites went into the land. And he says, you'll be kicked out of the land because you will not follow the laws of God. And so from 586 BC until the second coming, we're in, by the way, we're in right now, until the second coming, the Jews will be under punishment. Have you ever wondered why the Jews are dispersed throughout this planet? Why did they not have a land for 2,000 years? And today, what they have is hardly what they have been promised. It is a small fraction of what the land, their land is supposed to be. Have you ever wondered why the word Jew rarely leaves anyone emotionless? Just the name will often trigger hate or love, admiration or disdain. It is in this chapter where the reality lies. It is from here where we can begin to understand who the Jews are. Now the course, curses mentioned here are directly connected with the Mosaic Law. Chapter 27 stands as a preparatory text for these curses. In there we find the most difficult amends in the Bible. There are 12 of them and each is preceded by a curse. This is a conclusion of the law, saying that if the law is not followed, these curses will come about. The last verse of this chapter 27 sums up the whole thing. Look what it says. Cursed is the one who does not confirm all the words of this law by observing them. And all the people agreed. And they said amen. This is the conclusion of the Mosaic Law, so severe it is that from here, anyone will seek and exit from it. Because no one, in fact, can confirm all the words of this law. It's a catch-22 situation. No one can follow the law. And the exit, I want to tell you, is none else than the Messiah himself. As I told you, he stands right there. In Deut and Deuteronomy 28 builds on this. Let us begin to read some verses of Deuteronomy 28. There lies a synopsis of the history of Israel up to today and up to the second coming of Yeshua. Let's read from verses 15 to 20. By the way, from verses 1 to 14, you have the blessings. We'll conclude with that later. But beginning with verses 15 until the end of the curses. 15 to 20. But it shall come to pass if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments and his statutes, which I commend you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Cursed shall you be in your city, and cursed shall you be in the country. Cursed be your basket and your kneading bowl. Cursed shall be the fruit of your body and the produce of the land, the increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flock. Cursed shall be, you shall be when you come in, and cursed when you go out. The Lord will send on you cursings, confusions, and rebuke in all that you set your hand to do until you are destroyed and until you perish quickly because of the wickedness of your doings in which you have forsaken me. Do you see how important, how sin is to God, how sinful Sin is. This is some introduction, is it not? The first thing that is cursed is the land. While the land of Israel was promised to the Jewish people, and while it is theirs, this passage tells us that the enjoyment of the land it depends on their obedience of the law. 
If they do not obey, they cannot enjoy it. And so it is today. It all amounts to say that they fail to see the Messiah at the end of the law. Because they can do the law and they know it. In fact, few were the years when Israel was living in peace in the land. Let me briefly give you a, a short history of the land. You know, wh where, do, where does the history of Israel begin? Genesis 12. Some 4,000 years ago, Abraham was promised and given the land. However, in the same chapter, as he went to the land to see what it is, in the same chapter, in verse 6, Genesis 12, 6, he says, Abraham passed through the land to the place of Shechem, as far as the terebinth tree of Moray, and he says the Canaanites were there in the land. Who were these Canaanites, by the way? These were not one people. There were many, many ethnic groups dwelling in the country of Israel. Even at the time of Joshua, you can count 31 separate kingdoms that were called the Canaanites. So Abraham found the land occupied right after the promise. Some 500 years later, after the Exodus, when the Israelites as a nation went there, the Canaanites were still there and they were well entrenched there. The Amalekites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, etc., etc., they were there. And the Israelites lived with them, always at odds, at war with them, for another thousand years. Until they were pulled out of the land by the Assyrian in 721 BC, the northern kingdom, and 586 by the Babylonian. Then, when Jews returned to the land to prepare Jerusalem and the temple for the first coming of Jesus, these Canaanites were still there. And we see them, for instance, in Nehemiah and Ezra. In Nehemiah 4.7, it says, Now it happened when Sanballat, Tobias, the Arabs, the Ammonites, the Ashdotites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were being restored and the gaps were being closed, that they became very angry. They were angry at the Jews. The Arabs, the Ammonites, the Ash Ashdotites were only a few of them. You have the Samaritans as well who were there. And today we have the same angry people with the same hatred, with different names. Then after the Messiah's three-year ministry, Israel was further conquered by a new religion of the Muslims, then by the Crusaders, then by the Asiatics, Mongols. From the 16th century to World War I, the Ottoman Turks ruled Palestine, as they call it, because that was the name of Israel before. Then Britain ruled it under the League of Nations mandate. At this time, there were 500,000 Arabs there and 25,000 Jews only. And in 1948, the Jews, against all odds, went back to the land as we find them today. Has Israel ever conquered the land that was given to her by God? Never in history. There was a brief period of peace with Solomon, but it ended up in breaking the nation. I remember reading that when they asked Golda Meir, who was president of Israel in the 70s, how the Jews could stay in the land surrounded by so many enemies. She responded wisely. She said, we Jews have a secret weapon. In our struggle with the Arabs, we have no place to go. It is true that they never enjoyed the promises given by God in the land and they had nowhere to go. And so we find them today. Today, the Canaanites in many other forms are still in the land with different names, but with the same hatred. And all of this is the outcome of the curses that we find in Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 28 does give us a true synopsis of the history of Israel until now. Should not the Israelites follow the law of God? The law further promises in verse 21 to 22, it says, speaks of diseases. Fever, inflammation, and scorching heat and drought. To whom much is given, much is required, right? Verse 25 to 26 says that the nation will experience devastating defeats in battle. And on and on until you read, you reach verse 62, where we can, where we can understand why the Jews, being one of the oldest people on the earth, are so few. Only about 15 million people as these chart actually shows you. Let me read you verse 62. It says, You shall be left few in number. 
Whereas you were as the star of heaven in multitude, because you would not obey the voice of the Lord your God. This is what it is. And it is in verse 65 to 67 that really sums up for us the last 2,000 years of the Jews. And there it tells us, even before they entered the land, that they would be scattered unto the nations. This in 64 to 67. It says, Then the Lord will scatter you among all the nations, from one end of the earth to the other. And there you shall serve other gods, which neither you nor your father have known, wood and stone. And among those nations you shall find no rest, nor shall the sole of your foot have a resting place. And there the Lord will give you a trembling heart, failing eyes, and anguish of soul. This is the word of God. Verse 66 says, Your life shall hang in doubt before you, and you shall fear day and night, and have no assurance of life. And in the morning you shall say, Oh, that it were evening. And in the evening you shall say, Oh, that it were morning, because of the fear which terrifies your heart. And because of the sight which your eyes see, you know, you can almost see the Holocaust. You can almost see the pogroms. You can almost see the Inquisition in these verses. This was a prophecy. It is an ongoing prophecy that helped us to understand why the Jews never really were at rest in this world. And all of this because they did not follow the law. But in fact, no one can follow the law. What is the reason, really? All of this because they could not see their own Messiah. They, cannot, they don't want to see their own Messiah who actually weeps with them. If the law is rough, if the curses are unbearable, it is because they reflect God's standard of righteousness, a righteousness that only the Messiah can cover us with. It is with him that Israel and all individuals, Jews and Gentiles, can find salvation. This is what it's all about. This is what these curses are for. Let me tell you that behind this iron curtain of curses lies so much grace. And what might argue and say, how in the world would they know and understand all this? Through many, many ways. God went, covered every corner for every single person to know about these things. As we have seen, the whole law was designed so that the individual will be led to the Messiah. It all speaks of him. Because the whole law was riddled with types, with prophecies pointing to the coming one. From each, from the sacrifices, speaks of Yeshua, to even the lives of godly men and women, they typified one aspect of the Messiah. And be sure that no one was ever left to himself, lost to find a way towards salvation. This is why I say to people, if you feel that today the Lord is speaking to you, accept him as your personal savior. Before the law, the Israelites had the witness of their father Abraham, who spoke of a time when the Lord would provide the lamb, if you remember. He called the mountain where he was about to sacrifice his son, Jehovah Jireh, God will provide. They knew of the brazen serpent that showed that only faith in the word of God can save them. As for Jews and Gentiles in general, the Spirit of God says in Romans 1.20, whether one is a Jew or not, he clearly says in that verse, for that since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly sin. No one can say, I never saw God. There's going to be a judgment, right? It says they are clearly sin. Being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. So that, he says, there are no excuse. No one can say he does not know God. No one can say he never met God. The Bible guarantees that no one will find himself in eternal separation from God by accident. But I would like to end this portion of Deuteronomy with the blessings promised to those who committed their lives to God. These are found, Deuteronomy 28, verses 1 to 14. These blessings are for everyone who, will, who are obedient to the will of God. Obedience is always connected with blessing. The history of Israel testifies of this. For the Israelites, they were not obedient to the Mosaic law. For the believer today, he has to be obedient to the law of the Messiah. Both, by the way, are basically the same, except that the law of Messiah has no curses because he took it upon himself. Someone says that he had rather obey than work miracles, but the obedient will work miracles. 
miracles of grace by the power of him who works within. To obey is better than sacrifice, Samuel said. He understood already that if you obey, you have almost fulfilled the law. And what kind of blessing do we find here? See, there are seven blessings. Seven times the word bless is found here. In the Hebrew, seven, sheva, is from the root sava, which means to be full, to be fully satisfied, to have enough. Let me bring you to the beginning of Deuteronomy 28. From verse 2 to 5, it speaks of material comfort. We all look for these things, right? It matters not how much you have. You can all attain with what you have, material comfort. Just read verses 3 and 4. It said, Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall be the fruit of your body, the produce of the ground, and the increase of the herds, the increase of your cattle, and the offspring of your flocks. Blessings follow obedience. And in verse 7, it speaks of unfailing protection. It says, The Lord will cause your enemies to rise against you, to be defeated before your face. They shall come out against you one way, but they shall flee seven ways. The enemies of Israel are of the same kind of the enemies of those who belong to the body of the Messiah. They are many, subtle, mighty, but greater is he who? The one who is in you than the one who is in the world. Verse 7 speaks of properest work. The Lord, it says, will command his blessings on you and your storehouses and in all that which you set your hand and he will bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. That speaks to us. If we obey the word of God, seek ye first the kingdom of God, Jesus says, and I will give you these things. That's a promise he gave. God promises great things to those who are firmly planted in him. And as we read this, we may think that it is only for the Israelites of the time, but we have, by the way, a similar verse in 1 Timothy 4.8. It says, but godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that is now. Godliness, you know, is a very important word for us today. It speaks in the Greek of our practical religion, of our belief in God, and how we put God before anything, how we put his law in action. This is tied to our blessings. And I love what verse 9 of Deuteronomy 28 says. It speaks of our fellowship with God, you know, this is one thing we are to develop a relationship with God. It's a never-ending, by the way, and devious. He says, The Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself, just as he has sworn to you, if you keep the commandment of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. Should we take care of our walk, God is there to bless. And there is a progression. It gets better and better. Yes, there are fights, there are struggles, but you go from victory to victory if you abide in the will of God. And it is when we have this fellowship with God, this personal relationship with Him, that we can work with Him. See the following verses. See what the Lord will make of you if you follow His precepts. Look at verse 10 to 12. It says, Then all the peoples of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of you. And the Lord will grant you plenty of goods in the fruit of your body, in the increase of your livestock, in the produce of your ground, in the land of, of which the Lord swore your fathers to give you. And the Lord will open to you his good treasures, the heavens, to give the rain at your land in its season and to bless all the work of your hand. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. He will make you rich, he says. Then you will become, it says, a powerful testimony to the people of the Lord. Then, like David says in Psalm 51, 11, right? After that, he confessed his sin. He says, then I'm going to go and preach your word. He says it's here too. Once you have that relationship with God, once your sin has, are covered, then, he said, you shall be named by the name of the Lord. The name of the Lord upon us implies his life and character be cotton in us. What a privilege and a great responsibility to be called a believer. We really have everything we need, but we have to get it, right? We have to work to get the benefits of our salvation. Salvation is free, but then comes the hard work of discipline and changing 
our lives so that we may look like the Messiah. You know, to conclude, let me read to you a few verses. There are six verses here. Consider this if you want as a prayer. I'm not going to tell you which verses they are. I'm just going to read them. You can close your eyes if you want, and I'm going to follow with the prayer to close. Give thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Give thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in the Messiah, Jesus, concerning you. By Him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Give thanks unto the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. Thank you, Heavenly Father. As we're gathered here, Lord, we, we praise you and we thank you for what you have left us, your word. We recognize that you have given us your many promises for us to be still and to develop full confidence in you. To forgive our bareness, our busyness, our frantic Coming and going, teach us, O oh Lord, to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, knowing that everything else we need will be added to us. All this we pray in the name of Yeshua. Amen. May the Lord bless you and never finish reading the love of God. To get in touch with us, you can do so by telephone 1-888-685-5902. Locally in Montreal, 514-685-5902. You can also reach us through our website at www.arielcanada.com. Again, the phone number is 1-888-685-5902 or locally in Montreal, 514-685-5902. Website address is www.arielcanada, all one word, A-R-I-E-L, Canada.com. Be blessed. Shalom.